Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session on the DiffBot Knowledge Graph. My name is Mike Tung. I'm the CEO and founder of DiffBot. Um, sorry I can't be there in person to meet all of you today, um, but I'm very happy to be joining virtually and share with you guys uh, some of our experiences building a production web scale knowledge graph. Um, for those of you that have not heard about DiffBot before, um, just a, a bit of a, a primer on DiffBot. So um, we are a, a startup company that uh, was originally a spin out from Stanford where I, I was a grad student. Um, and the mission of our company is to build the world's first comprehensive map of human knowledge. And um, our, the way that we want to do that is by building a fully autonomous system that's able to read and understand all of the documents on the public web. So we were, uh, a spin out from Stanford through uh, what's called um, the Stanford Stardex Accelerator. Um, we were seed funded and backed by Andy Bechtelsheim, one of the um, first investors in Google and the founder of Sun Microsystems. And we power a lot of the big uh, tech companies here in the Bay Area. They use our technology companies like Facebook and Amazon, um, Cisco, um, NASDAQ, uh, and many startups as well. Um, and we are profitable. So we're funded primarily by our customers. Um, and um, so we are a, a, a commercial operation. Um, we have about 40 uh, members of the team and we hail from uh, 22 countries, I actually did a count this morning. So we're quite an international company. Um, we've actually found a lot of the folks that work at DiffBot through our knowledge graph. And they include people like um, Demetrius, who's the previous CTO of DBpedia, um, folks like Matt Wells, who um, was the founder of the Gigablast search engine, and um, folks like Matteo, um, who um, worked with Paolo at Roma Tre uh, and, uh, and joined our company as well. So here's where we are. We are located um, just eight minutes from the Stanford campus here in sunny California uh, in the Stanford Research Institute. So what I plan to cover uh, in this talk is, first of all, what is the DiffBot Knowledge Graph? What's the scope of what we do? Um, how it's built? I hope to share some tips uh, in our experience building you know, a production knowledge graph. Uh, go over some of the sub-problems in um, the pipeline of building a, a knowledge graph and uh, show like how these parts are connected together into an end-to-end -end architecture. Um, I wanna go over some of the current bottlenecks like actively right now, like at, you know, as, of, as of now and probably will be the next few months, um, some longer term research topics that we focus on and also um, resources that we have available for the research community. So the DiffBot Knowledge Graph um, we launched it, meaning we uh, made it commercially available to um, the outside world in 2018. So it's been about two years that it's been in, in commercial operation. Um, it's an automatically synthesized knowledge graph that's based on us actively crawling and extracting from the full public web. So besides uh, Google and Bing, we're sort of the only other US entity that does uh, full scale web crawling. Um, where we differ is, you know, what we do with those documents, which I'll explain, you know, in the following slides. Um, we currently have over uh, 10 billion entities, a trillion triples or facts, and we're adding about 150 million new entities per month as we crawl the web and discover new entities. The top uh, types of um, uh, types, entity types in our knowledge graph include people information, organization information, places, products, events, articles, discussions, images, um, we're adding things like job posts. Um, we're adding things, you know, like um, eventually medical entities and real estate entities. So we're continually continuing to expand the number of types of information in the knowledge graph. Um, we crawl the web from here in the Bay Area uh, in California. Um, we have a facility here where we have designed um, this hardware setup to do the web crawling and rendering and extraction. Uh, currently about 2,000 CPU cores, and it takes about four days for the entire cluster to build the knowledge graph. Um, our knowledge graph is available via a direct API where you query the knowledge graph using what's called the DiffBot query language um, through this um, UX, this dashboard, as well as through integrations. You can use it in um, other programs and applications. And hopefully I'll show you a demo of that. So um, here are sort of like some 
key components in our knowledge graph building pipeline, which I'll go over in a little bit more detail. But we start out with um, classifying um, the, all of the different pages as we encounter them in our crawl on the web. And um, earlier on, we did a study and we found that basically with about 20 or so top level page types, you know, types like articles, um, products, navigational pages, things like, um, you know, uh, image pages, um, discussion threads, you can cover basically about 98% of the, the pages on the web, the surface of the web. Um, and so the first step is page classification. Uh, then we perform extraction on the page after classifying and, and knowing what type it is. Uh, we use natural language understanding and also image understanding to understand the actual text on the page and, and um, the media on the page. And then we link information that's extracted from different pages that are referring to the same entity together. Um, so the first step is crawling the web. So I mentioned one of the um, people on our team, uh, two people actually are, um, had previously built a search engine called Gigablast um, and that competed against Google basically in, in the mid 2000s. And so when they joined our company, they already had a lot of experience in web crawling. They had written basically 2 million lines of C++ code that handled all of the edge cases and corner cases of crawling the web. Um, after we crawl the web though, we, we actually render the, the web inside a real um, um, rendering engine. So uh, one of the people on our team is a committer of the uh, Chromium project. And we've basically developed a highly optimized um, build of Chromium that's been optimized for machine learning. What that means is it renders you know, faster than the Chrome browser by stripping away a lot of the things that aren't necessary for uh, a machine to be using a web browser. Things like the, the bookmark manager, um, the, the sort of the Chrome or the visual elements, and even like um, even the reference counter is not needed um, for, for, um, for rendering like one shot pages. And then we, we instrument the browser so we can dump out all of the low level features of the page. So things like for every X, Y position on the page, we know like what's its RGB alpha value. We know um, what fonts are used on the page, what styles are used, how things are positioned on the page. We also um, know about all the HTTP conversation that's happening between the page and, and the remote website and all of the dependent resources, right? Like CSS and JavaScript uh, that might be called. We know the internal state of the, the JavaScript uh, virtual machine, for example, and the CSS layout engine. So we, we dump out all of these features as basically this, this long row of, of, um, of, of numerical values, and that's what we use to perform classification. So we do two types of top level classification. One is what type of page is it? So I mentioned there's these like 20 page types that um, most of the web, 98% of the surface can be classified into, things like a product page, an event page, a video page. And then we also classify um, what language is uh, because um, we, we want to build a single knowledge graph from the entire web. We, we, our goal is not to build um, separate search indexes for every language, right? Like, like commercial search engines like Google or, or Bing do. Um, so once we do that, we use machine learning and do this um, multi, uh, multi multinomial classification and we have the page type and the language. Then we move towards, um, now we know, okay, let, let's say this is a product page. So then we can move towards extracting the page. So um, what that means is uh, given that it is a product page, what are the individual parts of the page? Um, so we decompose the visual layout into, you know, like here's the, the product name, here's the product image, here's the price of the product, here's like the description of the product, here are like uh, our structured data about the product, such as its style or its weight. Um, and so forth. And this is all done using um, both the textual as well as the visual features, right? So it's basically, there's this joint feature space of both the, the text as well as the visual features, as well as the DOM level features, as well as, um, you know, this uh, internal state of the, the rendering engine. And it's performing classification on that in order to do extraction. So um, I can show you a quick demo of that. So, um, if you paste in a URL into our um, extraction API test drive. So let's find a URL. So um, here's a new site. For example, we would consider this something like a homepage or a navigational page type. Um, here's what we would consider like an article or content page. So if I paste a URL and put that into our test drive, um, what it's doing now, and that one returned pretty quick, so it's probably cached, like we probably saw 
um, that, that article already as we were crawling. Um, but we automatically classified this into type article. And then we extract the set of article specific properties. So the title of the article, the publication date, the author of the article, the author's URI, um, the clean text of the article. And we also extract things like, um, you know, like what continent and who the publisher and site is. Um, and here's like the entities mentioned in that article. So you can see like University of Alabama, COVID-19. Um, you see both its salience in, in this article as well as the sentiment uh, towards it, right? So it's sort of a neutral sentiment towards University of Alabama, but like a negative sentiment towards um, COVID-19. And each of these um, uh, identifiers corresponds to, of course, a node or an entity in the knowledge graph. Um, and you can also sort of browse and see, for example, that it, at the University of Alabama, Alabama, since it's an organization, it has you know, a subsidiary and it has employees. And there's also, uh, you can see all the other articles um, about that entity and images about it. Um, if you put in like, uh, let's just show as contrast a different kind of page, let's say like a product page, um, we will classify that as type product and then extract a set of product specific properties, things like the specs, um, the brands, the, the price, um, whether it has Wi-Fi, um, the category, the water resistance level. You can see here we're normalizing this into metric units. Um, as well as the SKU, and you can see it's in the category home camcorders, action cameras. So this is a um, very general purpose extraction API. Um, the next step after sort of extracting and then breaking it down into these, um, these uh, specific you know, elements is then we analyze each of these recs or areas of the page. So let me skip forward to um, showing you the kinds of analyses that we do uh, on these different um, semantic areas. So for images, uh, I'm not going to demo this, but we um, can extract things like the color, um, what, what type of item is inside the image, right, and link that to the KG. So, you know, if it's like a dog, like what's the breed of dog that's in there and linking that to it, or if it's a product, like which product is it? and linking it to it. If it's text, then um, we use um, natural language processing in order to um, build, um, extract facts from text. So um, let me show you an example of our natural language capabilities. So I put in here um, the bio of uh, Paulo Moraldo, uh, you know, our, our, um, our chair for this, um, this workshop. And so you can see here, here's kind of a typical kind of bio text about the person that you might find, you know, on let's say university website or on like a corporate bio website. And when you paste this into our natural language um, API, you can try this at home. Um, it generates a knowledge graph. So um, the way it does that is we perform entity linking. So we identify first of all the entities that are mentioned in the text. And then we identify the relationships between the entities. And you can see here the labels of those um, uh, connecting uh, the, the entities. Um, for each fact, we also um, have a bunch of uh, metadata uh, provenance information on that fact as well. So you can see here, um, we not only extracting this relationship, like Apollo is an employee or member of Roma Trey, but we also have qualifiers such as he started, uh, he, he's been associated there since 2011, right? And he was educated at University of, you know, Genoa Poto, but that's not current, right? That's in the past, he was there. So, um, and we also shows sort of like, where is the evidence for that fact in the text? It highlights that. Um, you can see here, we are doing uh, pronoun co-reference, right? To know that this he and his is referring to the same entity there. Um, and we also have like the degree of confidence uh, of each of these facts, you know, um, you can see here um, in, in, uh, in the predicate. And we're also extracting, for example, like the open relations, right? So these are relations that are not in our ontology, um, but are sort of like an unrestricted set of relations. Um, so you can see here, um, 
we're able to do this analysis in all of the major languages that are on the web. So I can show you an example of where, you know, if you were to pass in Chinese text, um, we can still build a knowledge graph from that, right? And you'll notice that the knowledge graph that's built is in, a ch in Chinese. It's a language free sort of representation of the knowledge. Um, this entity Apple, you know, it refers to, um, you know, the Apple, Apple entity in our knowledge graph, even though, you know, it, um, the surface form, you know, might have been originally in, in Chinese. Um, so that's how that's what that's one way how we can reconcile and build a multilingual knowledge graph from the entire web. Um, you can also see here we've we've built um, larger examples, you know, that that don't fit in this test drive of what happens if, for example, you pass in like the entirety of the um, the, the Bible, like the Old Testament, uh, into the natural language. You can basically build a family tree of the Bible automatically. Um, so let's see if I can find here. Here's Jesus. And this is quite large. So I don't think, um, I think the, the top of the tree, Adam and Eve, is somewhere uh, in this graph as well. So I'm not going to try to find it. Um, so, so that covers. Um, sort of our natural language capabilities. I do want to mention um, we released a data set called KnowledgeNet, which um, we believe is like one of the, um, the best um, data sets for relation extraction in that we exhaustively annotate um, all of the properties that are mentioned in the text. So you have like full recall of, of, of every fact that's mentioned in the text. And it's, um, it's an end to end, KnowledgeNet is an end to end task of building a knowledge graph from text. So um, uh, we published this at uh, EMNLP last year. Um, so uh, I'd invite you to um, take a look at it if you are interested in this um, um, text to knowledge graph problem and you want like a good clean data set to work on. Um, so here uh, we compare it to other um, data sets uh, in the past, like, like TAC KBP and things like DocRed. Um, th some of these are um, uh, distantly supervised um, algorithms, right? So they're not exhaustively annotated with a human, human being. Um, and so uh, we have a very clean data set. Um, and there's still a lot of room to uh, improve it. As you can see, this, the baseline of um, using sort of state-of-the-art techniques, um, such as using transformers and BERT, is still very far from how well humans can do it. Um, and so we, we've released as well, like a, a baseline system that you can get started with um, on, on, Git, on GitHub that you could check out. So after we extract um, facts from text and from images and from the structured data, um, what do we have? Well, we just have essentially a bag of all of these extractions, right? Um, we still have to uh, sort of cluster and link them together uh, in order to form entities, right? Because as we know, uh, there could be many pages on the web that talk about the same entity, right? So for example, I, I might have, and I'm a real world entity, a, a person in our knowledge graph, but I might have many pages on the web that have selective facts um, partial facts uh, about me. Um, I might have an academic profile or let's say a professional profile um, or, you know, like a profile, let's say on Twitter, on social media. And so this is the task that we call record linking. And so um, um, we, I can show you an example of that. So let's see, let me show you, for example, um, here we have, you know, like the University of Alabama. I can hit explain to sort of explain um, how this um, entity was created. So you can see here, there's many pages on the web, you know, ranging from like the local phone book to, to Wikidata, um, to maybe like Hoover's that, that talk about the University of Alabama. And we're able to use machine learning to um, link them together and then score them to form a cluster that's talking about um, the University of Alabama. Um, 
And so record linking, obviously the main challenge with record linking is how do you scale it to a, a 10 billion entity knowledge graph? Um, you obviously cannot compare um, 10 billion entities to each other. Oops, I lost my screen. So um, we've developed ways of um, doing this effectively, um, uh, making it computationally tractable, right? By, uh, by doing blocking and hashing. Um, it's still quite a large um, chunk of our knowledge building pipeline though. I believe it still takes up, you know, um, over like 12 hours on thousands of CPU cores to, to do uh, record linking at our scale. Um, so that's an active area of uh, research at DiffBot and we have someone who's full-time working on record linking. Um, so let me show you now, um, basically, uh, after record linking, there's some other steps. So we, we also, after we have um, a cluster of, of uh, these extractions, we then need to um, reconcile um, facts, you know, that were stated on, on different our different sites, a process that we call knowledge fusion. So um, there could be conflicting facts. Uh, there could be facts that are um, stale or out of date or, or um, something now it's mentioned on a page that actually was mentioned from another page that was published a long time ago. So Knowledge Fusion needs to be able to determine what's the most current information. It also needs to be able to reconcile conflicts and then estimate a probability of truth, and how much we believe this fact to be true. So um, I don't have a, a demo of Knowledge Fusion that I can show you, but I can show you um, sort of the final result and like how you, how you um, uh, can query these entities. So in the knowledge graph, you can search here. So I can start out with a search like, um, there's a couple of different ways to search. One is you can use this visual uh, query builder, which is you know sort of point and click. I can say, give me articles that are have the tag Donald Trump and search that way. Um, you can also equivalently uh, so that'll give me, you know, articles that have Donald Trump that mentioned in the article. And you'll note that it's, um, you get articles uh, in all languages, right? So it's, it's really a multilingual KG. I could restrict that. So here you see what's called the diffbot query language to um, only the articles where the language is, let's say, in English, EN. And that should be all English articles. As you can see here, these are all in English. Um, I can also say, okay, give me all, um, let's see, organizations. I can, I can use a visual query builder um, that are in the industry, let's say, um, aircraft manufacturers um, that are in the, let's see, uh, country of France, okay. So you see like Airbus, Safran air, aircraft engines. Um, so that's just showing you guys an example of, of querying the knowledge graph. So you can see um, these different organizations here. Um, and you can even, um, I mean, you can we even have a better map view that you can visualize these entities. So, you know, we can, let's say, go to Tokyo. And we can browse sort of the Diffbot knowledge graph geographically. Um, so from this position, you can see here um, mostly manufacturing and ser service companies sort of in, in view right now. These are also articles that are being mentioned. Um, we can zoom in a little closer can see here, like here's um, an entity in the knowledge graph. The, the, the height here represents sort of um, how many edges go into that entity in the KG. 
So you can see here the employees that work at Marubeni in Tokyo, and it's a trading company. Um, you know, if I zoom in even closer, I'll see, okay, lots of restaurants basically and entertainment companies um, and sort of smaller businesses. This is like the local uh, Lawson, it's like a 7-Eleven. Um, cool, so that's an example of uh, how you can query the knowledge graph after you have these entities. I also wanted to show an example of how the knowledge graph can be used to clean and normalize data and used from other applications. So let's say, you know, you are a business that has, you know, a bunch of customer records. Um, these might be, you know, your suppliers, they might be um, companies that you've purchased inventory from. And as you can see, even in this toy example, there's a lot of um, examples here of, of data quality issues. So you can see in this location field, you have missing values. You have locations that are specified at different levels of granularity. Like here's um, a city level, here's like the country level, here's like a, a fully specified address. Um, here you have like second floor attention, Bob Goodman. So it's like a, a, like a hyper-specified address. Um, and you even have like a web address here. So one thing you can do is you can, let's say, enhance this organization using the diffbot knowledge graph. And let's say, you know, these are the fields that I want to display or get. And what I have to provide is like the name and I have like the location, just these two values. So you can see here, um, I can essentially use our machine learning to link this um, input or partial information that might be noisy and have all kinds of noise to it to entities in the knowledge graph. And you, by doing this, you can see immediately like these two entries um, actually have the same identifier in the knowledge graph. So we've been able to like deduplicate this information. And now we also have the complete address instead of just United States or just San Jose. Um, We've been able to fill in missing values. So clear speed, we have its location now, it's Bristol, Virginia. Um, we've been able to uh, fix uh, typos. So like Palomar Technologies Inc. INK is, is now just Palomar Technologies. You know, that's obviously the, the INK was spelled wrong. And we're even able to, um, you know, normalize the language. So um, this looks like it was, you know, a Japanese company name. Now it's an English Itochu Corporation. Um, we also know the number of employees of the company and also what industry they're in. So we have additional insight that we didn't have in the original data. So I can see that a lot of these, you know, are like semiconductor companies or, or hardware um, electronics companies. So um, one might use this to, to perform data uh, analysis by getting, you know, more insight about your customers. Um, you could also find, let's say, similar kinds of organizations. Let's say I wanted to find organizations um, in the industries um, of semiconductor companies um, that are in the country of say, the United States. Let's say that have the number of employees at most uh, 50. And let's say I want these, show these fields, same fields as above. So if I typed that correctly, you can see um, the, the knowledge graph, uh, one popular use is to automate sort of this uh, market research and intelligence. Um, so I've, I've now built up like a, a set of companies that's very um, similar in characteristics to uh, this, this first set. Um, so great, so that's um, an example of, of data cleaning. Um, what are the current bottlenecks, right, that we're facing in this, in this knowledge graph building task? So, you know, I mentioned it takes like about four days to build the knowledge graph. Um, we, one of the, the, the bottlenecks that we're dealing with right now is, you know, uh, 
we couldn't find any database that can really handle bulk loading, like trillions of predicates. Um, essentially, we're building a new knowledge graph each time. And so um, none of the sort of current graph databases that we tested can really handle like this bulk loading uh, of, of, of data. So they're all sort of optimized for after you've loaded the data, then, then query it, right? And so we either have to design our own system or, or implement a system that can handle you know, bulk loadings of trillions of predicates in less than 24 hours. Um, we're currently, you know, trying to scale relation extraction across, you know, um, thousands of domains and millions of predicates. We still need like a uh, hundred to thousand uh, training examples um, per predicate to do it at production levels of accuracy. So um, we're, we're working on how can we reduce that to, to few shot learning um, and also, how can we take those open relations that um, we've discovered as we're crawling the web and, you, and realize, okay, which of those open relations um, are popular or commonly expressed on the web? And then how can we automatically promote those into ontology predicates and discover um, new predicates automatically and sort of build, um, build that without us having to um, explicitly model, right? Like what those predicates should be. Um, Knowledge Fusion, I think, still is like the largest uh, researcher algorithmic challenge. Um, it's uh, about how do you score the trustworthiness of, of different origins, right? We all inherently trust like wikipedia.com more so than, you know, let's say uh, a blog that was just registered, you know, last week. And um, what is like the page rank equivalent algorithm um, that we can use to assign a, a trustworthiness to that origin? Um, so we have like a version of, of sort of knowledge based trust that we run. Um, but we need to make that better. And also we have all of these um, different ways that we extract facts upstream, right? From natural language, from images, um, from visual extraction. Each extractor has its own, you know, uh, score uh, and probability from its model. You know, we have uh, 50 to 60 different models or uh, individual um, machine learning problems that we study at DiffBot. So how do you automatically calibrate all of these scores uh, from the upstream extractors and reconcile them uh, when you're fusing them together? Um, that's um, something we're actively uh, working on this month. Um, and then uh, another challenge that, that's active right now is how do you train high quality embeddings for the tail entities? So it's, it's very easy to get you know, uh, high quality embeddings for like Donald Trump or Jeff Bezos. But when you have like the tail predicate, the tail predicates and also tail entities, uh, and you may just have a couple facts about about that thing. How can you train like a high quality uh, embedding that's useful enough that can it can be used to disambiguate that um, that can be used in, in entity disambiguation when you're reading text and you see for example, Mike or Sam in there, and there may be like uh, one million mics in the knowledge graph. Um, you need to to um, you need to find the right one, even though it, they might not be a celebrity or something that's not in Wikidata or or, or Freebase. Um, so uh, that is uh, computing the quality of the embedding and also doing it at scale is something that we're actively working on. Um, so you'll notice actually a lot of these bottlenecks. Um, a lot of them have to do with the scalability, right, and the, the size of our knowledge graph and, and trying to get um, techniques not only to be very accurate, but to 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 work on, on a very large knowledge graph that's being built basically every couple of days. Um, longer term uh, research areas, so things that, you know, we don't expect to solve in like the next few months are things like um, how do we build like a natural language interface to the knowledge graph? So you saw me uh, querying the knowledge graph in the Diffbot query language, which is a structured query language, but how can we um, uh, take advantage of things like um, language models in order to just describe what we want in, in English? And also how can it synthesize a response um, that's in the native language of, of the user uh, from the, the entities that match? Um, so natural language generation. Um, how do you generate high quality images for the entities in the knowledge graph? You know, if you have all of these sort of noisy web images, um, can we generate like a 3D view or a canonical um, representation, a visual representation, right, of, of that entity? Um, open relation extraction, I think will always be like a long-term research area for us um, until we've actually solved natural language. Um, and 
Um, also, how do we, um, so what we call low latency entity detection. So when, for example, there's like a, um, a, an active event around the world, right? Let's say like a, a school shooter or, you know, a, a viral outbreak like we're facing right now. Um, within how many minutes can you, from when that event occurring, you know, generally we're, we can detect that article appear on the web within 15 minutes uh, in our crawl of the web. But then with, after how many minutes can you have constructed an entity with facts um, about that entity sourced from those articles and now being able to use that entity to, to do entity linking. Um, so um, you, you obviously for certain kinds of things cannot wait like the full uh, knowledge graph building cycle, right, of four days. Um, so you need to have um, incremental updates of the knowledge graph and um, real time updates of the knowledge graph that are purely in memory, right, that never touch disk. Um, and then lastly, automatic ontology construction. So uh, we have essentially um, crawled um, the whole web and we have uh, like, you know, for example, how uh, these entities are described in the um, categorization scheme of the, uh, the web page that it's on. How can we um, use all of these different trees and, and categorization schemes and build sort of like a consensus ontology automatically um, without human supervision? Um, because we will never be able to curate, you know, essentially um, a, a master uh, ontology of, of all human knowledge. So we'd like to, you know, scale that effort. Um, so these are all long-term research areas that we're super interested in. Um, I should mention that uh, we collaborate, you know, as a lab with um, a lot of other academic research labs, you know, including UMass, Stanford, uh, UCI, um, University of Alberta, and the way that we collaborate is we give researchers free access to our knowledge graph and APIs and tools. So um, give them access to our data, our actual data center, so they can run experiments inside of it. Um, we also give them access to our researchers. So um, we've co-authored, you know, some papers from those collaborations together. Um, and we've also uh, supported uh, students and faculty, you know, financially on projects, you know, that we think are underserved and would, would not otherwise get funded. So if you um, uh, have you know, ideas of ways that we can collaborate or ways that we can help your lab, especially like in, these, in some of these long-term research areas, um, please reach out to me and let me know. So um, you know, in summary, uh, hopefully this was a, just an overview of um, the Diffbot Knowledge Graph. You've got a chance to see you know, uh, me using it. Um, and also, uh, you know, I covered some of the, the major um, components, technologies that we use and that we study here at Diffbot and some of the resources that we have available to the community. So thanks a lot again for your, your attention and the invitation to come speak at DI2KG. And please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye.